Welcome to the Queer Spirit Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Venagoni. Here we have conversations with artists, healers, and activists who enliven the LGBTQ communities and who empower our queer spirits to flourish. Before we get started with the interview, if you haven't heard, I've started a Patreon account for the podcast. Patreon is a way for you to help support the show and get special rewards in return, such as a thank you shout out on the show and an enamel button with the Queer Spirit logo. This year, I've also added access to videos of the podcast interviews and a free monthly live virtual sound bath. If you'd like to join in supporting the show, just go to patreon.com forward slash queer spirit. You can also find the link in the show notes. Any Patreon funds remaining after the basic production costs will be donated to nonprofits supporting diverse queer communities. Once again, that link is patreon.com forward slash queer spirit. Thanks for your consideration. My guest today is Keone. Keone is a queer, a heretic, and a fool, here to help us shift the paradigm and welcome the higher dimensions through play and joy. They bring dreams and visions for the collective through their paintings, poetry, and storytelling. For them, it's all about energy, helping nurture our energetic connections with plants, trees, and other beings, and also helping us clear blockages and bring medicine to our own energy bodies. Today, Keone shares some poetry from their new collection, Love Songs for Boys, and they share with us about the interplay of their paintings and poetry. In our conversation, we dive into nature versus capitalism, messiness as a path to healing, and laughter as medicine. Find Keone on Instagram at Keone1973. That's K-E-O-N-E 1973. Hi, Keone. Welcome to the show. Hey, Nick. Thank you for having me. How are you? I'm good. It's so great to have you here. Someone from across the pond. (laughs) Hey, thank you. (laughs) Yeah. So you have a new book of poetry out called Love Songs for Boys. And I thought we could start the interview by having you read us a selection from the book. I'd be really happy to do that. Yes. I've been thinking quite a lot recently about white supremacy and patriarchy. And while that's not a huge theme to the book, when I opened it randomly today, the poem that came out, I thought was very appropriate and fitted in with that. So I'd like to read this poem. It's called The Dead Tree. Great. The dead tree is a frozen moment, stripped of green and sapless, is, for now, standing, though the story of swelling has left it. We see the size through which the light will pour. Its exterior is a stolen treasure in a museum, worn smooth by nameless millennia of touch and crack. Next to it, a moorhen creaks. Within... Some billion tiny tidiers and more eat it to dust. For now it stands. Another rush begins its splinter home to a playground for children and lovers to remember each other by. Thank you. You're welcome. (laughs) I'm curious if you could share with us a little bit about how what the imagery is that inspired you and how you tie that into what's happening now in our world politically. Yeah, I'd love to. So quite near where we live is an ancient woodland. And at the moment, politically, ancient woodlands are being chopped down at an alarming rate all over the world. But especially, well, not especially, but but within this island, they're being cut down for a, a railway line, a very expensive, slightly pointless railway line. And I feel really blessed that there is ancient woodland still nearby. And, and I was there last year and, and I saw this tree and it was beautiful it was like a sculpture but it was completely dead and yet there was the sense of of how much life was being supported by it that was actually eating away at it and for me it kind of feels like a metaphor for for the system that we're in for patriarchy for white supremacy for ecocidal capitalism i feel like it is at root it's a dead system and yet it is you know there there is so much within it it's still standing and yet really everything that's taking place is is about bringing it to the ground is about helping it to collapse and helping it to be composted into something hopefully more useful yeah as you were reading it i wasn't sure like is the tree the thing that we're trying to take down or is the tree the thing we're trying to keep alive you know the interesting and the beautiful thing about ancient woodlands is that they're 
is they're full of, they're very honest in the way the cycle of life is happening. So, you know, you're as likely to see a new sapling rising up as you are to see the old dead branches of something decomposed. Whereas when I look around at, at the kind of the human, you know, sculptures and the, and the edifices of this system, it's almost like there's a pathology against anything rotting. Everything has to be shiny and new and rebuilt and the consumption earth matter and raw materials to make that happen it's just devastating it's devastating the planet it's devastating us and and for what for something that appears so slight so meaningless and so privileged in terms of who it's who it's rewarding Mm -hmm. yeah i definitely agree with you about how i think particularly in western culture we and you know quote unquote first world countries that we feel like everything needs to be shiny and new and clean and everything. But I also think about old things and how much history they hold and the beauty and their patina, you know, like in buildings and stuff like that. And, you know, here in the United States, we don't have old, old buildings like you do in Europe and in the UK. And so I think there's a way that like, particularly American psychology doesn't really allow for that. We're always constantly building. But I also know that in Europe, you know, there's this strange juxtaposition of, you know, old buildings right next to brand new buildings and the ways that cities are starting to change and evolve. And I think that, you know, just using that imagery as a symbolism to affect the way that we think about what's important and what's valuable can go so deep. Mm -hmm. And then also bringing it to the environment as you are with this poem around trees as well. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I love, I think there's a real beauty in things decomposing. I think there's a, and there's an unsung beauty to it. This idea of kind of things collapsing you know, we hear a lot about gentrification and, and there are deep, deep problems. I think that one of the main problems with gentrification is that if we don't allow for other areas to decay and fall into disrepute or actively go on their journey to somewhere else, then we just end up with nowhere for for artists or, you know, people whose labor is more integral to the, the survival of the hive to live. No one can afford to live there anymore. Yeah, great. I actually, you sent me a copy of your poetry and I didn't read that one yet. You're, there's quite a few poems in it, so I haven't gotten around to everything yet, but I was surprised to hear that one because most of them are more about relationship and queer identity and that kind of thing. Yes. But this one's very different, <laughs> which is great to hear that. But I wonder if you can share with our listeners what inspired you to write this book? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, for sure. I mean, this book has been 25 years in the growing, in the writing. And for a long time, it was, you know, I would kind of turn to poetry when I was younger, very much as a kind of, as a medicine, as a way of, of helping tend my heart after relationships had ended. or And even if those relationships were very fleeting, you know, somehow there was a way in which I would be looking maybe to have the conversations through poetry that I really wanted to have with the men who had vanished out of my bed or out of my life and who sort of disappeared. And I think ultimately wanting to have a conversation with my father, who also, you know, vanished when I was quite young and died when I was uh, not much older. So I think, you know, there was a kind of a, a motif, even though I didn't realize it for a while. And then by the time I got a sense that this was what was going on, I'd kind of also entered into a fairly limiting headspace, which was these poems wouldn't see the light of day until I was dead, if then. Like either they would be published when I was dead or they would just die on, on the laptop with me. That was my thought process for almost a decade. And actually what uh, COVID did and what the experience of lockdown did was I started to go through my old journals because I'm a kind of compulsive journaler and it's a real practice that I find also really helpful. And my journals are their places where I sketch, where I record dreams, where I say what's been happening, you know, all sorts of stuff. And, and what I noticed as I was going through them was that I was kind of getting rid of the pain and going, well, I don't need to keep, you know, I might have needed to write this, but I don't need to keep it. I can burn the pain away but I'll, I'm going to keep, here's the poetry, and this is what I want to keep. And suddenly, there was an enormous body of poems. And I suddenly had to question this whole sense of, well, what am I waiting? Why am I keeping these? 
until I die. Why? What is that about? And actually, as I looked at them, they began to really take a form that made a sense to me. And once that happened, yeah, it was a case of going, then let's let's bring them to the world. Let's bring them out. Beautiful. So for the listeners, I've decided to take a little bit of a different stance with this interview with Keone because he sent me a list of a bunch of different words and ideas of things that we could talk about. And so I don't know exactly what we're going to talk about. I may just pull a word out of the magic hat that he sent and see where this goes. But going off of what you said, I'm thinking about your art also that you post a lot of your paintings. Are they paintings or digital paintings? They look a little digital. Or maybe just the colors are so vibrant because they look... <laughs> They are very analog paintings that I paint with gouache on paper uh -huh. and the colors are beautifully vibrant. And I started putting like, this is as far as I go really digitally. I started to move my finger over the background of photos to block out with certain colors, but that's a very small new thing. But yeah, including the painting that's on the cover of the poetry book, they're all gouache. Okay, great. So I'm curious if you ever if paintings inspire poetry or poetry inspire paintings, or if you ever pair them together at all, because I can see there is a kind of, at least for me, there's an energetic connection there that I think sort of brings out the poetry a little bit more by looking at your art too. Thank you. It's an interesting one. Yeah. I mean, I can think of one sequence of poems in the book, Major Arcana, which were completely linked to a series of paintings I did inspired by the major arcana of the tarot back and inspired by a particular man. And that's interesting because I painted the paintings first and then afterwards, like some months after uh, he and I had had, you know, had this kind of quite profound life-changing encounter. I then kind of went back to them and, and found that they were able to tell a story that maybe I wasn't aware of at the time. Similarly, the painting on the cover is also uh, inspired by this person. And there's definitely, I'm more aware now of a kind of fluidity between the two. The biggest contribution, I think, I, I mean, I painted when I was a kid and like putting makeup on, like, you know, wearing my auntie's clothes, my mom's clothes. It was something that was really, really kind of, you know, I was shamed out of, not successfully out of doing. I was just made to feel a huge amount of shame for continuing to do it. And painting, kind of occupied a sort of similar space. It was never something I didn't do, but it was something that was really, like all the voices around me were telling me that I was doing it wrong, that I needed to not do it, that, that you know, it was a pointless thing to do. And so in a way I kind of, I did sort of put it, you know, like some of the clothes that I wanted to wear that I felt shame to, I kind of put it in a bottom drawer. And actually the moment when, painting found me again and like a channel kind of came through that was the moment that I think really started to help my poetry because I suddenly realized how it was possible to let something come through you and to exist and to step away from it to let it be and to go this is the work and then here's a new sheet of paper and this is the next one before that point my poetry I would kind of like I edit it to death like I have a poem and I'd be like no, I'm going to change that word and that word and that word. And I'd kind of like go at it until there was just kind of shreds. I was left with shreds going, I have destroyed another poem. So painting really helped me with that. And yes, and I feel now this sort of this dance between writing and painting. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's very active. Well, I mean, I'm not a poet or a writer, but I can imagine that for some people, part of their process is shredding it in a way, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of editing and I can also see how painters could do that, too. I mean, I've heard about painters who will do a whole piece and then they'll paint over it completely, except maybe one little portion of it. Yes. You know, I've burned paintings into the ground. I've, you know, like ripped them up and incorporated them into other things. I think there is something really healthy about that. But but at the same time, I think I'm really enjoying at the moment the experience of letting things come through and not overworking them. That's what painting has really taught me, the ability to be in flow and not be kind of in your head going, do I want to put this line here? Do I want to put this stroke here? Just like, no, get out of the way, let it come through. Yeah. 
Well, I'm looking at, you know, this list of words and one of the ones that I circled was messiness. And it sounds kind of like <laughs> a, a little bit that's what we're talking about, which is the messiness of making art in a way. Yes. Yeah, the messiness of life, the messiness of all of it, the, the mud of it, you know, the compost of it, the fertilizer of it. Yeah. Someone, a really amazing healer and life coach who I've connected with recently said, you know, the mess is the message. Mm. And that kind of resonated for me. It's like, yeah, you know, that's, there's something so important about allowing things to be where they are. And I think as well, like where we are right now, God, there's so much, I can see, I can feel it in myself, the really kind of four planets in Virgo tendency to want to have everything neat and wrapped up with a bow. And like, here we've got through this nightmare system and we're all out the other end and it's all great. It's like, no, you know, that's not how this shit goes. You know, be with it, be with the uncomfortable and see what comes through with that. And that is your next step. Yeah. And I think going back to what we were saying earlier, you know, with this desire to make everything clean and new with, you know, buildings and deforestation and that kind of thing, it's, I think there's something in there about our aversion to the messiness of life. And I th also think about, you know, working with my clients and my therapy practice, you know, just the other day, I was talking with a client who was had this metaphor of basically kind of saying, I'm afraid to go into that messiness, you know, that's not their word, but they're kind of afraid to go into the messiness, because they're not sure how if they're going to be able to come out of it, you know, or are they just going to completely fall apart, and not be able to put themselves back together again. And I think that's actually one of the great things about messiness or decomposing, you know, as a mess, right? Mm -hmm. We have to fall apart in order to put ourselves back together and build anew. Yeah. And I think this is all connected. You know, it's all very root chakra, um, root energy sensor, like learning for us. It's, you know, when we're kids, the first artistic creation that we make is our first poo. You know, we make something, something comes through us. And I can't remember that far back, but my heart says, I was really happy with that poo. Like I really <laughs> celebrated the poo that I made. And I'm guaranteed that around me, like the first reflection that I had, and I guess for all of us is, uh, uh, no, don't touch it, uh, bad, uh. So I wonder how far we internalize that. And then we feel this kind of, you know, aversion to it. And I'm fascinated by the fact that toilets are white. Like in here in the global north, we have white porcelain toilets. And I'm like, what kind of fuckwittery decides that the place which gets all of your fecal matter needs to be white? This is so perverse. And also then that we are in such a hurry to flush it away that actually all of that is really great. You know, it's really great if we just compost it into a compost toilet, a couple of years down the line, we have got the best kind of soil for any kind of fruit trees and bushes and nut trees. It's hugely important. So it's like, again, it's like we're almost denying part of a really core cool part of the process because of this squeamishness or this aversion. And I think it's really interesting, you know, in the healing work that, that I do for myself and with others, the shadow of the, of the root energy center is fear. And how much of this is all about fear? It's interesting hearing you say about your client, the, the fear that, you know, if you fall apart, you won't be able to put yourself back together again. And what happens when we allow that fear to dictate the, the way that we move through the world and we run away from what we actually need to be metaphorically and literally getting our hands into and really celebrating? Yeah, I mean, I also want to acknowledge that for a lot of people, the fear is that they'll be destroyed by something and that there's probably something from their past that make that feeling very real. And so it takes a lot of courage to be able to go into that to allow yourself to crack or crumble or fall apart in order to build yourself anew. But I do, I do think that, you know, there is a lesson in meditation on messiness. Yeah, and I completely agree. And you know, Mike, I'm not saying this from a really separate point of view like I when I had my nervous breakdown like that was a massive cracking and absolutely there were moments of going oh my god I've fundamentally broken something now there is something that 
you know, that will never be able to be whole again. Mm -hmm. And it's true. There was something that was broken. But I really, one of the things I remember in the hospital where I was recovering that really impacted was this mosaic, this beautiful mosaic of blues and golds. I found myself just looking at the mosaic thinking, this wouldn't exist had they not broken the tiles. Yep. But you're right. It's, yeah, easier to look back from the other side of it and sound all like, yeah, we did that. But not everyone comes out of the dark. And yeah, I totally respect that. It makes me think about, I can't remember what it's called. You might know that there's a Japanese style of pottery where they fill the cracks with gold. Yeah, kintsuki. Yes, exactly. Yes, absolutely. Things are, and I love that. I've been thinking a lot about, is it shibori? The Japanese art of making something more beautiful by mending it. So like this jumper that I'm wearing now is one of the things that I love so much that the more w worn it gets, I just find bits of fabric and, and repair it. Yeah, and the kintsuki, the, the repaired with gold. I love that. And again, coming back to what we were saying about that sort of fixation with the new that we find in capitalism, that's what we don't allow ourselves to experience, that joy of repair and, and mending and what happens to things when they aren't just you know, ripped down and reconstructed from, you know, glass and steel and you. I'm also looking at another word from the magic grab bag <laughs> that you sent me that I'm calling it, which was laughter as medicine. And I can see in some ways laughter can be messy too. And I think that when we fully allow ourselves to just kind of let go and fall into the messiness of laughter is when it can probably be the best medicine. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. I mean, I was watching Shit's Creek recently, and I was also drinking a cup of tea. And there was a moment of kind of connection where something, I can't even remember what she said, something that Moira Rowe said, and I just spat the tea out everywhere, all over everything, because it was so funny. And I love it. I think laughter is a beautiful thing. But yes, absolutely. It can be so riotous and explosive in many different ways but there's a real joy and a medicine in humor mm -hmm. yeah i think can be really cathartic and it's and it's always interesting to watch how laughter and tears can be and sorrowful tears you know can be so closely connected i mean i've seen it go both ways with people you know they start laughing and then they turn to crying or they start crying and they turn to laughing <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, there's this full body kind of shaking that can happen with both of them. And I think there's a way in which that's a messiness in terms of the body composting the emotional energy. It's like turning it over. Oh, I love that. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, howling, raging, weeping. There's something, there have been times when I've cried and it sounds, I'm hearing it, and I'm like, it sounds like I'm laughing. Mm -hmm. I've heard other people, and I'm, there's a part of me that's like, are you laughing? Or are you crying right now? What, there absolutely is that. I don't know, I think anything that, that helps us be in body, so, you know, dancing, you know, falling around, wrestling, tumbling, uh, venting, you know, there's such a power and a medicine to all of those. And it is something that I feel at the moment, oh, we're very far from this, because we're very contained within this dialogue with the machine so that really very time the only thing that's really moving sometimes is our fingers and our thumbs sometimes you know and it's just like wow what about the whole rest of you what is everything else doing right now think of your whole body as a thumb <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> swipe it exactly swipe it. <laughs> so are there any special stories you have about the ways that laughter has been medicine for you i think there's part of how I move through the world that is very much about the archetype of the fool. I really resonate with that. I really resonate with this sense of not really having a clue what's coming next. And there's an aspect of that which can feel really courageous and really bold and really brave. There's an aspect of that which looks incredibly stupid. But I think, you know, either way, there's something that if you allow yourself to occupy that, you bring laughter to the world just in the way that you move through it. And I feel that's so important, especially with the quantity, the, the, the enormous quantity of fear that has come up through the experience of COVID-19 and the pandemic. This enormous sense of, again, coming back to what we were saying before about 
you know, I'm frightened that this thing might destroy me. It's like that. That's the root of it. Again, the sense of, you know, and, and the, the fool is the voice that goes, hey, guess what, kids? We're all going to die. That's how it goes. Mm -hmm. And now how are you going to live? And I also feel like there's something that is really queer about this archetype. It's like the fool represents the beginning and the end of the major arcana in the tarot pack. And there's a lovely line that says, you know, the fool has the wisdom of God, which um, the fool has the foolishness of God, which is greater than the wisdom of man. And I think that there's something within that that is so queer, that ability to be, uh, you know, the, 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 the top and the bottom at the same time, that kind of like, oh, my God, this is looking so cool and genius. And then, oh, you look a total mess. That ability to confidently go into both places, you know. So in terms of your question, yeah, I mean, I think there's probably been so many occasions when I've, you know, fallen out of clubs or danced like I look like I'm a jellyfish on steroids or, <laughs> you know, or just ended up kind of busting out moves at the bus stop. And that for me is, you know, I love it when I see that. I love it when I see someone walk down the street in the most ridiculous combination of clothes beaming because they are so excited to be alive it's what i resonate when i'm with children when i see children that kind of that ability to just be and not just children but i think there is something that you know is really present for a lot of us when we're young to not be second guessing how we ought to be in the world and just being it yeah it's interesting when you were talking about this going from the fool to the god it reminded me of this movie i watched recently I'll mention the name, but I won't mention the actors or the platform just for <laughs> commercialism's sake. But it's called Bliss, and it's new, and you can watch it online. I'll tell you that much. Oh, yeah. But it's about this guy who hates his job, hates his life. Everything's kind of falling apart. And then he meets this woman in a bar who looks kind of, well, she's homeless. But she has this kind of quirky wild streak, and they sort of fall into hanging out together. And then she ends up telling him and temporarily convincing him that they're actually not living in reality, they're living in a virtual reality. And that the real reality is they actually live in this life in this world, and they're a couple in this blissful world. And she actually created this technology to go into virtual reality where everything is horrible and awful so that you actually really value what you have in your life mm -hmm. but then the guy who's the main you know more of the main character he's kind of like well well which is real and which isn't and he he does they do go back into quote-unquote reality um through her eyes and part of the movie and then they go back into this place where their life is kind of miserable and he ends up seeing the beauty in both mm -hmm. So it's kind of, you know, he kind of is sort of going through that cycle of being the fool and being God at the same time and really seeing beauty in the messiness of his life and really learning to work with that. I love that. Yeah. And it also makes my brain go, what? <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it. I love, I really, one of the phrases that I really find so powerful at the moment is both slash and mm -hmm. you know we've got we've had you know the patriarchy has given us so much either or like it's either this or that and then you know you've and one is good and one is bad and, uh, it's like it's both and you know yeah it's, it's to both. go from the binary to the non-binary trans beautiful queerness yes 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 and to triangulate you know to move from this kind of seesaw and to just find this kind of really amazing magical stability of the kind of the three mm -hmm. and the flow that goes with those the kind of movement between all of them yeah yeah well I, I feel like we could riff on this all day but as we begin to wind down i wonder keone if you can share with us a person practice or experience that has supported your queer spirit to flourish oh so many I really want to support and shout out to the, the practice of Gabrielle Roth's Five Rhythms. That was so huge for me in terms of helping me find my shamanic pathway, leading me into contact with so many amazing queer channelers and healers. It just, you know, an incredible 
uh, way of embodying exactly what we were talking about, the ability to go into a room and roll around on the floor, to scream, to stomp, to laugh, to vent, to allow everything, like you were saying, to compost and transmute and transform whatever is ready to shift. Um, so yeah, shout out to Gabriel Roth and the Five Rhythms and all the all the many amazing teachers who are taking that practice and and reinvigorating it and changing it and or you know evolving it into their own style and also to all the ancients and the indigenous peoples from whom Gabriel you know sourced this work by going and traveling around and studying you know these beautiful communities that have been like the the kind of that have held the treasure of this you know this eternal dance the ember of it over this incredible time. And for those of us who don't know what the five rhythms are, can you share a little bit about what that is? No. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, so Gabrielle Roth was, you know, she was this amazing punk energy woman in, in New York who everyone was sitting down still and meditating. And she was like, I am a New Yorker. I cannot just meditate. I cannot get there by sitting still. She was really, you know, she was a performer, a dancer. She was really interested in what dance could offer us. And she noticed these patterns amongst all these different indigenous tribes and their dance practices. And the first rhythm that she noticed was this feminine rhythm, this flow rhythm, this rhythm that seemed to be unending and going on forever and just airfulness. And you could just circle into it and it would never, never end. And what she noticed after that was the more masculine staccato rhythm, which was a rhythm that was much more angular and edgy and defined. And it was here and it was not there. And it was about levels and edges and boundaries. And then she noticed the third rhythm, chaos, which was like a crucible where these two rhythms came together and who knows what was gonna come from that, that moment of alchemy and magic where you bring these two and you do, you make it into the third and al or allow the third to come through. And the fourth rhythm, the lyrical rhythm is where you get to after that crucible, which has a feeling of lightness softness you know a kind of release about it and it is possible of course to then circle back and continue but she would close the practice with the fifth rhythm which was stillness which is one of the most beautiful paradoxes that you can be still and you could you are still moving you know ultimately the that final rhythm is death but even before then you know how much how much movement there can still be in softness and stillness and quietude so, Keone, where can people connect with you and find your poetry book? The third tree on the left in the woods. So I'll meet you there. I'm not massively online. The best place is to head over to Instagram. And my handle is at Keone1973. And there's a link there to Lulu where you can, can purchase a copy of my book. It's also available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Great, great. Well, I'll have those links in the show notes so people can find them there. Or they can just go to your favorite yew tree, correct? And find you hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll be there. We'll see you there. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> well, Keone, it was lovely having you here and talking about the joy of messiness with you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nick. It's been an absolute pleasure to be uh, yeah, really nice to hang with you. Thank you. To find the resources we discussed today, find the show notes at thequeerspirit.com. And if you enjoyed the show, remember to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. This will help us reach and support more queer people all over. Thanks for listening and see you next time.